gospel poor. I mean, uh, we've had enough preaching that we should have won the world over. I've heard preachers that said, look, I'll preach something different when you start doing what I've already preached. Amen. So, um, anyway, how many of you know that we're in a society now that it's nobody's fault? I talk to people all the time that are struggling with issues in their life, and let me just say everybody has had or will have some kind of issues that you'll deal with in life and that you'll struggle with. And uh, I would even venture to say that um, even uh, the Cleavers, for those of you who, who remember, they had trouble in their life, although it looked like a perfect marriage and perfect family on television. You all with me? Say amen. And by the way, those families are gone <laughs> as far as television goes. But we live in a society where excuses are just made, um, lies are just told. I shared a blog a couple of weeks ago entitled Liar, Liar. And uh, I should have added pants on fire, I guess. But anyway... Uh, I really scared myself when I'd done that because the Brother Ray met me the next morning and said, man, I got that tele or that text and he don't have the smartphone. All he just got is said, liar, liar. You know, and it, of course it come from the pastor. So <laughs> anyway, I'm glad he had enough wisdom to, to talk with me about that before he went and posted everything and said, pastor's called me a liar. Because <laughs> that was not the case. William Glasser said in his book, Reality Therapy, uh, he makes a statement that man is not responsible, or excuse me, man is not irresponsible because he is ill, but man is ill because he is irresponsible. When A.J. was in third grade, he had a teacher named Mrs. Day. Any of y'all ever had an encounter with Sergeant Day? I nicknamed her Sergeant Day because she got A.J. in line like a drill sergeant. You know, I mean, um, she taught what she called responsibility. Now, we're talking about, uh, I can't remember if it was, it seemed like it was in third grade. It might have been the fifth grade. That, all those years are going together now. But nonetheless, uh, no longer did she remind you every day of what you're supposed to do over the night or over the weekend and have ready for Monday. And she would, you know, say responsibility. And, of course, she, you know, sort of made it almost lyrical as she said it. And uh, so, but what she's trying to convey is that you're responsible. When you get to middle school, you're going to be responsible. They're not going to run behind you like we are doing. And then when you get to high school, they're not going to run behind you. And some kids can't hardly make it in college because they absolutely are not going to run behind you. Are you with me? Say Amen. And it gets, I mean, even right on up through graduate school, that's how it's going to be. So, but in our age, we've been marked by the age of what many have called victimization. Victimization cries, it is not my fault. Victimization blames other people and other circumstances for one's predicament. And it blocks the pathway for someone to take personal responsibility. In fact, it is rare for anybody to take personal responsibility. That's why I said the other day when, <clears throat> when Alabama lost to A&M, when Nick Saban took responsibility for the loss himself, I admire that. That somebody says, you know what, that was my fault. I didn't have them ready. But victimization blames other people and other circumstances for one's predicament, and it blocks the pathway to personal responsibility, and it teaches our children that it's always somebody else's fault, and you're never really responsible anyway. Listen, it engages in what some have coined endless self-pity. Today we have no fault automobile insurance. We have no fault divorces, we have no fault, moral choices, and the list of absurd excuses can be seen in a couple of cases that I want to quote to you that actually came to courts in our country. Here it is, for example. An Oregon man tried to kill his ex-wife. He was acquitted on the grounds that he suffered from depression suicide syndrome. 
whose victims deliberately commit poorly planned crimes with the unconscious desire of being caught or killed, he didn't really want to shoot his wife. He wanted the police to shoot him. Or another case is the famous Twinkie Syndrome. I didn't know about this. A case that involved the attorneys of Dan White, who murdered San Francisco Mayor George uh, Moscone, who blamed the crime on Dan's emotional distress and listed his junk food binges as, you know, the cause. He was acquitted of murder and convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter. In other words, we're not responsible for anything, it seems. Pop psychology has conjured up so many new addictions that now no one can be held responsible for anything. Watch this. We used to blame the devil. <laughs> and then we blame society. And now we've learned to blame genetics. Now there's a new wave of biological uh, determinism, if you will, a gene, and the gene mapping continues. We hear more and more about genetic uh, determinants of behavior and justifying our belief and just, you know, if we get hooked on alcohol, we look back and Grandpa drank and we say, well, you know what, I was predisposed to be a drunk because my grandpa was a drunk. That don't hold water with me because my grandfather, Alton Sains, my dad's father, was an absolute drunk until he got to his deathbed where Daddy prayed through with him to meet Jesus. Same thing with my grandmother, Lois sayings all the way until she was uh, at the end of life but she did accept the lord thank the lord but both of them were drunks drunk so much so that they would drink paint thinner that they would drink alcohol i'm not talking about i'm talking about isopropyl alcohol they would drink anything um hair tonic anything just to get high just to get drunk but my dad's not a drunk now, he's got brothers and sisters that were. He's got those who have been delivered. So what I'm saying, I, yeah, you may have that predisposition to be, but I, I go by, in fact, I had a real dispute with a, a lady one time, and I really didn't mean it to be a dispute, but she was so avid about it, I just could not just turn the other cheek and walk away and refute, I mean, what the Bible says, that she was an alcoholic, and I'll always be an alcoholic, and I said, well, hon, I don't believe it that way. I said, the word of the Lord says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Now, now, granted, if you got delivered from alcohol and we got to have a visitation, you know, by ABC Liquor Store, I'm probably not going to send you in the first six months to go visit the person that lives right next door to the liquor store because we are going to employ some common sense, right? If you got delivered from crack cocaine, you don't need to be going where they sell crack cocaine. Huh? Now, you'll get to a point where you'll be strong enough and, and, and it's all good. But we don't want to expose you again because you might get converted real quick. But nonetheless, we, you know, uh, we have this idea that nothing, nothing is our fault. Um, you know, but, but I said to this particular lady, whom the sun sets free, no, no, I'm an alcoholic, I've been an alcoholic, I'm going to be an alcoholic until I die. I, I, well, I just don't agree with that. I don't believe that. To me, to say that limits the power of of the blood of Jesus. If he can't set an alcoholic free, then he can't save one soul. And we all answer him kind of slow. But, but if he can raise somebody from the dead, if he can save somebody like you and me, if he can deliver my mother, uh, my father, whoever, your mother, your father, if he can change a homosexual, he can change anybody and deliver them. Now, you may still struggle with a desire. I've seen people delivered from nicotine that still have a desire to go back to that. They know it's wrong. They're praying, asking God to help them with it and stay away from it. Yeah. But I'm telling you, God has given us the power to be set free, and whom the Son sets free is indeed free. Uh, some people are delivered instantaneously and don't even have a taste for it no more. In fact, they'll get sick when they even think about it. And then others have a little bit of a, uh, you know, a walk through recovery in that area. Now, your vice may be different than someone else's. But let me just say this. I'm talking tonight about excuses and why we always say it's not my fault. I just believe I could have named this message taking responsibility because I think that we get to a place in our life where, the, where we've either got to do one of two things. We've got to take responsibility for who we are, where we are, and how we are, or we've got to blame it on somebody else. And if we blame it on somebody else, 
or something else or our past or past or our genetics or whatever, then we, we destine ourselves to stay in that same rut. But if we take responsibility for who we are, where we are, and all that good stuff, then we're on the ladder to get out of it. We're, we're on the climb. Okay, so we've developed an elaborate excuse system in our country. Three primary types of excuses are offered, and I want to share these three with you. The first is I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Now, I have, and you have as well. I have uh, watched my children do things, and they declared to me that I was seeing things. They would say, I didn't do it. I've talked to church members who said, I didn't do it. Me watching, me knowing. I've talked to, you have to, on the job. You've seen it. I, I didn't do it. You see, the, it comes in the form of denial. I didn't do it. Or alibis. Huh? Uh, I, I couldn't have done it because I wasn't even there. Huh? I couldn't have said it because I took down the post. Oh, modern day technology, right? Um, so, um, so we deny it or we have an alibi we couldn't have been. Or if, if we can't deny it and get by or we can't. And then listen, I'm saying we, so uh, I, I'm in this boat with you. Are you hearing me say amen? Alibis, well, I didn't do it. I couldn't have done it. Or then we say, I done it because she made me do it or he made me do it. So, you know, Adam and Eve use that excuse in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we find where uh, the excuse started. You know, they said, well, the woman you gave me, and then she said, and the serpent that you created beguiled me. In other words, uh, Adam blamed Eve, Aim, uh, Eve blamed the snake, and ultimately blamed God. So we passed the buck. Are you hearing me say amen? So, and then Aaron did the same thing. You remember when Aaron, and this was the most ridiculous of all the things in the Word of God, for, for a man of God who's a Levite, who is the high priest, to say this. Uh, Moses is up there on the hill. He's worshiping God. He's, trying to, he's getting the commandments written in stone. He comes down, and the people are, you know, they, they're not as godly uh, as they purport to be. Moses comes down. He's, only, he's gone 40 days, and in that meantime, they say, make us a God because we don't know what's happened to Moses. Well, they ought to know Moses was praying. I'm sure Moses left word that he was praying. But nonetheless, they said to, Mo to Aaron, you're the mouthpiece for, for Moses, and we want you to make us a God. So you know what he did? He told them, break off your necklaces and your anklets and your earrings, and, and he made a golden calf and told the people, now this is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is what the high priest done. Are y'all hearing me? Moses come down and he saw it. He was beside himself. He threw the Ten Commandments down and broke the, the Ten Commandments that the finger of God had just written on tablets of stone. He broke them. He was upset. He goes to the leader because the, the leader's always got to take responsibility for what's happened in the camp. Are you hearing me? Whether it was his fault or not. In this case, it was his fault. I mean, it was both their faults, but he was the man in charge. He could have said, no, we're not going to do that. And Moses said, what is this that is happening? First thing he starts saying, you know the people, how they're set on mischief. And while that is true, he knew better. Are you with me? In fact, you hear the lie that he told. Now, I'll tell you something. If we go down this road of alibis and blaming others and making up lies and falsehood, pretty soon we'll, we will... Uh, we will think that God's as foolish as we are. We will somehow entertain the fact that God really believes this junk that we've trumped up. Huh? I, have you ever had somebody tell you such a ridiculous lie right to your face and you thought to myself, you nut. You really expect, I mean, you didn't say it, but you thought it. You really expect me to believe this and, and I know full well better and I believe you know I know better. Huh? I've talked to them kind of people. Y'all probably haven't, but man, we got them. I've seen them. So, but, but Moses says to him, he says, what is this? He said, well, you know, the people, their hearts are set on mischief. They wanted a God, and, and so he said, now he's going to justify himself. I told them to break off all their gold and all their jewelry. You know why? Because while on the mountain, God was writing with his own finger in the tablet saying, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, that, that message and those commandments hadn't got down there to him yet. And I believe that could have been an attempt of the devil to keep us from getting the commandments. However, 
He goes and tells this lie. Nobody would believe this. I threw all this gold in the fire and this is what walked out. My Lord. I mean, that goes back to the days of raising the children. You mean to tell me an inanimate object, a, a, a golden calf that don't have blood flowing through it, don't have a brain in its head, has eyes but can't see, legs but cannot move, ears but cannot hear. You mean to tell me a golden calf not only formed itself, that's as stupid as the Big Bang Theory, but then he walked out of the fire and now sits here as a supreme God that delivered all of y'all out of Egypt. You see how ridiculous that is? It, it's, that's what happens when we, number one, say, I didn't do it. He's looking at this golden calf. I didn't do it. You know, I, I throwed the stuff in there, and this is what walked out. And and the people they're set on mischief. You know how they are. Now Moses made him take responsibility. He made him have the the, the golden calf ground down and made every one of them drink uh, the water. He said, pour it into the water supply. Y'all wanted this God. Now get your bellies full of him. Huh? That's right. So, that's the first one. Um, it's not my fault. So, here it is. The, the first response is, I didn't do it. Second is, um, it wasn't so bad. It wasn't so bad. Okay, let, let me, I'm going to help you with this one because you don't, you don't get it. Notice with me 1 Samuel 15, 13 through 15. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now, let, let, let me say what's happened here. The commandment to Saul was to go into this battle and kill everything. Saul decided on his own, I'm going to keep the best sheep. And, you know, I know what God said, but, and some of us are guilty sometimes of trying to help God out. God says do this, and we say, well, God, I'm going to do most of what you said. But I know better about this than you do, God. And this is what Saul said. And so Samuel says to him, have you done what I told you to do? Have you done the commandment of the Lord? And he says, I have kept the commandment of the Lord. And so what he's saying is, is what I did wasn't so bad. And so... Saw or Samuel, the prophet, says, What then is this bleeding of the sheep that I hear and the lowing of the cattle? In other words, you have kept some alive. And what Saul is saying is it wasn't that bad. It really is not so bad. And that's what amazes me of where the church has gotten today. When, when we get to the point, and I'm not trying to be legalistic because I hate legalism. I hate that with a passion where we try to be so spiritually minded, so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. You can go to two extremes. Huh? You can go so far this way that you're out there. And you can go so far that way that you're out there. There has to be a balance. There's got to be something. There's got to be a balance between the spirit and the plumb line, as we've talked about. But he said, it wasn't so bad. It, you know, and we do the same thing. You know, we do our own little thing. Uh, it, it wasn't so bad. You know, uh, I've done this and I've done that. Uh, so, in other words, we say we minimize, we minimize the, the ordeal. It was only a white lie. They probably knew I was joking. We tell ourselves. So, we justify and we give good reasons in our own mind for our misbehavior. And we rubber stamp it as okay. It wasn't so bad. Nobody really got hurt. Getting quiet in here now. I can't hardly see you too much because of the lights, but anyway. So we say, I didn't do it. That's one way. And the next way is, man, it wasn't so bad. You know, it's all right. The third um, elaborate excuse system is this. Yes, but. So this is an admission followed by an excuse. I've had people come to me before and say, Pastor, first of all, I want to tell you I'm sorry for what I have done. And if they would have stopped right there, that would have been a perfect apology. 
but their but just messed it up. They say, I'm sorry for what I've done, but I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't have said that, or I wouldn't have done it if you hadn't have preached that, or I wouldn't have done it had we, you know, sometimes our buts can mess us up. I would do this, but, you see, it's an omission of guilt followed by an excuse. It takes the form of, I couldn't help it. I just couldn't help myself. I didn't mean to do it. Uh, have you ever seen somebody? I didn't mean to do that. And they meant, I've seen people, let me give you an example. How many of you like to watch um, a court proceeding if it's a high-profile case? Huh? Maybe it's a rape case. Maybe it's an O.J. Simpson trial. Maybe it's um, uh, Casey Anthony, uh, who should be in prison, by the way. Uh, or any of those, whatever it may be, and I had an opportunity to work as a bailiff in Superior Court of Evans County for five years. So some of the tricks of the trade that lawyers use is this. They, they want to go in there and say something for the jury to hear it. They're going to go in there and, and they're going to say it. Now they know as soon as it comes out of their mouth that the other attorney is going to jump up, Objection, Your Honor! And the judge is going to say, Sustain, uh, uh, if you'll strike the last remark. But still, the jury has already heard what he said. Yes, they're going to strike it from the record, but you're not going to strike it from their minds. And he's going to instruct the jury. And this attorney over here is going to say, Would the judge please, uh, Your Honor, would you instruct the jury to disregard the last remark? He's going to say, The jury will disregard the last remark. But you can't get over it. It was said. You know, in other words, if this guy has already previously been convicted of rape, that cannot be said, but yet he says... Well, weren't you convicted of rape in 1980? Oh, you know, and of course, it's out now, or whatever. And whatever the case may be, they can withdraw the question, they can rephrase it, they can do all that, but they have heard it. And so what we do sometimes is, uh, we do like that, we say, oh, whoop, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Forgive me, Judge, I didn't mean it. Right? And sometimes we're guilty of doing things or saying things knowing what we're intending to say or do, and then pull back and say, oh, good Lord, I didn't mean it that way, when the whole time we did. Getting real quiet up in here. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. So I didn't mean it. It wasn't really me. Boy, that's another one right there, mistaken identity. Huh? Now, now, in the drug world, nowadays it's gotten so bad, if the GBI or the FBI, if they don't have your face on camera, on moving camera, uh, it's almost impossible to get a conviction anymore based on an eyewitness. You've got to have it on tape. Why? Because we've got the Big Brother surveillance. We've got the cameras smaller than a pencil lead. We've got so much stuff now. And even back then, you know, 17 years ago, if it was not on tape, it was hard to get a conviction. You could get it at that time, but almost now it's impossible. Now, I have seen them again and again and again Bring into evidence, here's, uh, here's the guy that comes up, you know, selling the dope. There he is in black and white. Well, not black and white, color. Color. The, inside the, the, the car is a camera, and it's got him right there, got his voice. And he's going to tell that jury, that's not me. Huh? That's not me. <laughs> Mistaken idea. In other words, and so many times we're not careful, the excuse is that, you think you saw me, but that, that wasn't me. That was a twin of mine or something. Now, anyway, so now let me move on. So we have redefined sin. So in other words, I didn't do it. It wasn't so bad. And yes, I did, but. Okay, so we, re, we, we redefined sin in our day. Um, someone said that sin went to the psychiatrist and come back a disorder. And it went to the doctor and came back a disease. And then it went to the sociologist and came back an environmental response. And he went to the educator and come back a learning disorder. And he went to the economist and came back a financial, uh, you know, indiscrimination. Um, so God comes to teach us, as He did Adam and Eve in the garden. He asked the question, what... Have you done? And he wants a simple answer. 
It comes in Genesis 3 and 13. He, he doesn't ask, what have others done to you? He doesn't ask, what privileges have you been denied? He doesn't ask, um, were you raised in a dysfunctional family? He doesn't ask, how has society treated you? Uh, has it been unfair? He hasn't asked, um, were your parents alcoholics? He didn't ask, were you below poverty in your upbringing? He asked, what have you done? There comes a time in life, if we grew up without our parents, I know it's bad, I know it's a, a, a tragedy, uh, if we grew up in a, an, an abusive situation, uh, it, it is sad, it, there, there's no doubt about it, and you have to, to give some leniency to a point there, but there comes a point in our life where we are responsible for our self. That's, you know, and don't let me go too far into the election here, but let me just say this. After three years, four years, it's your economy. Huh? It's your crisis. And I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican or whatever, but at some point after, like for instance, I, come, I become the pastor. Listen, after 17 years, I believe it's my fault. Are you with me? In other words, let me say, at least my responsibility. You cannot go on forever blaming somebody else about anything. So anyway, so he said, what have you done? So that is not to discredit the negative effect that our upbringing has on us, because truly it has. But, we have a, we have, but what have we done in response to take charge of our lives? We cannot control what has happened to us. You cannot. But we can control our attitude and our actions in response to the things that happen to us now. And we can decide by the grace of God that I'm going to rise above my upbringing. I'm going to rise above the abuse that I was handed down. I'm going to rise above this and that. You see, it's only when we take charge of our own lives and determine to, to be different that our destinies will be different. Then we're truly free to live a life unto God who created us. And, and once, we, once we realize that we can take charge for our own self, we take responsibility for our own self, we're truly free, in my opinion. Listen, because I don't want to live in a life uh, of blaming everybody else for the reason I, I, I don't become what I'm supposed to become or I don't make the mark in life that I'm supposed to make. I, I would get tired of blaming him or blaming her or this one or that one or my boss. I never got the break. I never done this. I never done that. Listen, there's a time in life where we say, you know what, I am who I am by the grace of God. And wherever I am in life, I'm going to be the best of whatever I am. I'm going to give it my all where I'm at. You hear me? And when you do that, I, I just believe that you're going to rise up above the ranks. I don't care if I'm a street sweeper and I'm not demeaning that. I'm going to be the best street sweeper that I can be. Now, uh, let, me, let me try to move on. Sometimes we make excuses rather than answer the call of God on our life. Like Moses, he's at the burning bush. And God says, put off your shoes for the ground where you stand is holy ground. And he tells him, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. And all of a sudden, he says, oh, but, but, but God, I can't speak. You know, it's one of them things where he says, here I am, Lord, please send my brother. You know? And I think so many times that, you know, we, we oh, God, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And God impresses us to do something. And uh, all of a sudden we say, oh, God, I love you, but I'll, sure some, I'll support Amanda if she'll do it. I'll support the pastor if he'll do it. And you know what? Maybe you ought to do that until you get up the courage to do whatever God's called you to do. And then, you know what? We fought sometimes the Apostle Peter because he was loud. He was boisterous. Sometimes he got, most of the time, he got his tongue engaged before he got his brain engaged. And, you know, uh, even, even when the Lord said, get out of the boat, he got out of the boat, man, he just jumped right out there and started walking on water. And so, yeah, and he sank. And yes, he did. Hey, didn't nobody else get out of the boat. Huh? It's easy to sit back and laugh at him and cut him down and all of that, but he's the only one of the twelve that walked on water. 
Are you hearing me? I got to give a man credit that'll try. You know, uh, it's one thing to sit there and whine, you know, just whine and carry on and make excuses. But for somebody says, you know what? He said, come. I'm just crazy enough to get out and try to walk on it. <laughs> and you know, I have found out. You know, my overseer told me, and I, I, oh, brother Garner, I love him to death. Man, he just he beat it through my head the six years he was here. If you're going to do something great for God, you've got to start somewhere. If you're going to do something great for God, you can't listen to what man says. I understand you, you, you've got to take advice and all of that stuff, but you've got to be led by the Spirit, and at some point you've got to move forward. And if you mess up, then you learn the lesson. Get back up and go forward again. Now, okay, so he says, I can't speak. And then Gideon, what about the angel of the Lord comes to him, he's threshing wheat, and he's hiding up under a tree. And uh, he says, thou mighty man of valor. Oh, no, you got me wrong, brother. He said, oh, no, the Lord says you're a mighty man of valor. He said, you're going to be the one to deliver um, <clears throat> the Israel out of the hand of the Midianites. He said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I, I'm the least of my father's house. I'm poor. And, you know, I'm a nobody. Let me tell you something. God thinks more of you than what you think of you. As a matter of fact, God don't take the, the great somebodies. He normally takes somebody that's a nobody in their own eyes and makes them somebody. Hmm. So he said, my clan is the weakest clan, and I'm the least in my family. And, you know, what about Jeremiah when he told God? He said, uh, you, you know, when God called him to be a prophet, Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. And the Lord said, don't tell me you're a child because you shall speak, and you shall say what I tell you to say, and you shall go to all the places I send you to. And I am with you. I've touched your lips with a coal from off my altar. I have put my words in your mouth. So later in life, Jeremiah said, I'm quitting preaching. I'll never preach again in his name and I'll utter a word from his book. He said, but I tried to forbear, but it was like a fire shut up inside my bones and I could no longer forbear. Y'all hearing me? In other words, when God has called, ooh, goodness, when God has called, he said, I just cannot. So, man, I'm just through my introduction. What time is it? Lord have mercy, I got to hurry. So anyway, so let me just say this. It's time to stop making excuses and start setting examples. Are you with me? There are three things I want you to know about taking charge of your life. And here it is. It's very, very simple. Number one, we are free. Look at your neighbor and say, we are free. We are free. You see, the first thing that God told Adam when he put him in the garden was, you are free. He had freedom for everything he wanted to do in that garden except eating of or touching that tree in the middle of the garden. Other than that, he said, you are free, man. Have at it. God has endowed each of us with the power of choice or volition. You get to choose. You get to choose. And when you choose, you can't say the devil made me do it. You can't say the pastor made me do it. Uh, you know, whatever, you get to choose. But see, with choice comes responsibility and accountability. Because I am responsible for the choices I make, and I'm accountable to God for, for what I do and how I lead people. So the human will separates man from the remainder of creation. You see, that volition that God gave us, we get to decide what we're going to do. That power of choice. Um, so we're more than just biological urges uh, and instinctual responses. We are made in the image of God. We are endowed with the power to think and to reason, to discriminate, to judge, to decide. And all of that adds up to the power of choice. Will. Or volition. We get to choose. So, um, having survived Hitler's death camps, psychiatrist Viktor Frankl said, the last of all human freedoms is the freedom to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. You get to choose how you're going to respond or react to whatever happens in life. I don't care how bad the news is or how good the news is. You get to choose whether you're going to open your Bible or open a fifth. Y'all hear me? You get to choose what you're going to do, how you're going to respond, how you're going to react, etc. 
So we are free. Number two, concerning life and our excuses, uh, not only are we free, but we are responsible. <clears throat> Sometimes we try to assume the responsibility for others. You cannot take responsibility for, for what other people are doing. We end up frustrated because we cannot live our life for someone else. And sometimes my children frustrate me because I want them to make different choices. But I can't live my life through them, and I can't live their life for them. I can pray for them. Are you hearing me? So, so we're, we, you know, we're responsible for others, but we are, uh, we're responsible to others, but we're not responsible for others. There's a difference. Um, we have to consider how our choices are going to affect people. Let me tell you something. People looking up to you, I don't care how you think or believe, they're looking up to you. And the choice that you make tonight, the choice that you make tomorrow, the choice that people see you making will affect other people. You might not know how many people are watching, but they're watching. So, uh, let me go on. Uh, they're they're going to look at you. So, uh, we need a deeper uh, consciousness that takes into consideration that everyone who sees me is going to be affected by the choice that I make. So I need to make a good choice. I need to make a mature choice. Maturity considers others better than ourselves. Notice what Philippians 2 and 3 says. Each of you should not look only his own interest only, but to the interest of others. Um, I heard about a pastor... Uh, who gave up the ministry after 20 years. And he gave up the ministry to become a funeral director. They asked him why he made such a change. He said, well, I spent 12 years trying to straighten out John. He said he never got straightened out. And I spent 14 months trying to straighten out the Smith marriage, and it never got straightened out. He said, I spent three years trying to straighten out Susan, and she never did get straightened out. And now when I straighten people out, they stay straightened out. <laughs> A little comical, and I don't know if that is even true. But I get the point. Are you hearing me? That, uh, and, and you know what? The truth is, life is fluid, and life is changing. Someone says, well, why do you straighten them out, Pastor? Because they're just going to get messed up again. Well, you know, I took a bath yesterday. I'm going to get me another one today. Because they don't last. Isn't that right? You know, in about 24 hours, you need another one, some a little more often. Y'all hearing me? I mean, but, but you don't give up on bathing, at least I hope. If you, you know, because, uh, because they don't last. You have to renew that. And the Bible tells us, it gives us a, another scripture about renewing our mind. Because, yes, you come to church and you got touched and you were ministered to. You may even fell out in the altar. You may have shook and stammered and spoke in tongues. But that's not a once for all. We have to renew ourselves again and again and again. Now, Pastor David Cooper gives an illustration from his first pastor. And he says this. In my first pastorate, he said, <clears throat> I arrived late at the hospital, emergency room in Athens, Georgia. He said two young people had just been tragically killed in a car crash caused by their own foolish choices. Disillusioned and angry, a group of teenagers asked me, how could God allow this to happen? He said, I responded with understanding and yet with clarity and said in truth, God did not consume the substances and God did not drive the car under influence. It was tragic, no doubt, but don't blame that on God. That's tough. And you know what? Then the other side of that, somebody will say, well, you know what? My innocent person, child, friend, husband, daughter was tragically killed by a drunk driver who crossed the yellow line and, and for whatever reason, they're gone. And to that I say, uh, it did not surprise God. That is as, that, that to me is even more tragic. Uh, but we don't know 
what would befall that person next month, next year, in eternity. We, we, there's so many variables that we do not know. But we do know one thing, that God is in control and that God is sovereign. And things like that. And you know what? There's going to be other things that's going to cause you to scratch your head and say, Lord, I don't understand. Paul says to us, right now we see through a glass darkly. And we don't get it all the time. I'm going to tell you something. There's been times in my life where I would have absolutely done uh, choice A. And now the older I get, I look back and I say, Thank God that I didn't do choice A back then, that God did not allow me to go that route. Something happened and made me take choice B. Because I could not see then what I can see now. I'll just say this, that God has oversight. So, uh, and you know what, I, I'm, really, um, I'm really not good with so many times nowadays. Listen, because this, this happens uh, all the time. When tragedies happen, and, and um, I'm going to be careful how I say this. Tragedies happen so many times pastors are accused of preaching someone to heaven. You don't see any of them preach them to hell anymore. And the truth of the matter is you can't preach them to heaven or hell. You live your life, and when you die, instantly you stand before the Lord to be judged. And it's his decision, heaven or hell. But what, but what blows my mind is when someone tragically dies in a tragic situation where everyone knows they were steeped in sin, they were, they were at the height of, um, of sin and died tragically and instantly. Now, listen, I don't want to get up and say, well, he's in hell now, although it may be true. And I've preached some that I absolutely did not know. And you're not going to hear me saying, well, he's sitting. I've seen people, uh, you know, the last thing they were doing was smoking a joint, you know, running from the law 200 miles an hour or whatever. Well, he's talking to Jesus beside the river of life now. He might be. I'm not going to get up and say that because that ain't what my Bible says. I know that's tragic and that's bad. But when we get to the point where we rubber stamp everything, well, you know, God's grace and he knows and whatever, and we can do anything, dying in the commission of a crime where we're, you know. Now, let me, since I've gone down this road, let me try to make some sense out of this because I know people are going to light my email up tonight. Anyway, uh, I don't know if you have time to pray or not, you see. Someone who leaves that party and they're high as a kite and they're, they're, they're drunk off their feet and they have a tragic accident, you know, that's between them and God. Uh, obviously, my mind says, I, you know, it's hard for me to see how you had sense enough to pray. But then again, there's people that got hit, lay on the side of the road, and they're laying there for 10 minutes, 20 minutes till the ambulance gets there. They finally get there, and then they pass. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe in that time frame, that, that few seconds or minute or whatever it was, their upbringing, their childhood came back to them. And in their dying hours, they said, Lord, please forgive me. I know I've, I've done terrible. I've, I'm drunk off my feet or I'm doing terrible things or whatever. And just that quick, God would forgive them. So we don't know. I know people who took pills to kill themselves. And I personally believe that they've done that with the thought that I'm going to be able to have time to pray before these pills kill me. They did kill him. I mean, took him and his wife. But uh, I, I'll always believe till my dying day that they felt like if I can somehow take these and then pray rather than just boom, you know, kill yourself like, you know. Now, and then, Lord, I've opened up a can of worms now and get into all kind of stuff because there's the argument too that anybody that would put the gun to their head is mentally off or, or you know and but again God is the judge I'm not the judge but I, I do have a problem when we don't take responsibility and I think it's irresponsible for any preacher to go to the pulpit or anybody else and talk about how we're sitting at the you know on the river of life and knowing how I just I just don't buy that and I hope it don't ever happen to none of you or me but my theology just don't go that way. And I hope, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, 
I just don't see it that way according to the word. Okay, we're accountable. Last but not least, we're accountable. So uh, uh, we are free, we are responsible, and we are accountable. See, we are answerable to God in the day of judgment. If we are in Christ, we do not need to fear the judgment because Christ has pardoned our sins. There's a lot of scripture, but I'm not going to take the time to go through all of that. We do need to live our lives in a way that we're going to give an account for the way we walk before the Lord. Um, so we need to, to walk in such a way that when we stand before the Lord, we can say, Lord, I did everything I could do to set an example worthy. Um, so um, making excuses. You know, I, and I didn't go through it all, but Jesus made that great banquet and People began to make excuses. So some said, I've bought land. I've got to go check it out. Some said, I've bought oxen. I've got to go prove them. Another said, I've married a wife. I've got to, you know, I got to take a year off because the law says I can. And uh, I think God just gets tired of our excuses because God knows when there's a valid reason and when it's just an excuse. You all know me, for those of you who have been around me a long time, about 10 years ago I come up with this saying, uh, you know, uh, you'd hear us all talking about it. <laughs> We're talking about if somebody's going to offer a lame excuse or just something that's really not a reason, it's just an excuse, I, you know, you might as well just tell me I'm out of peanut butter. I ain't coming to church because I'm out of peanut butter. <laughs> I was like, that's as good as the lie you're going to make up, right? So uh, anyway, um, so I don't think God's pleased. Well, you know, he don't want us to to live in a, because I think, we have to have some integrity about if, if I can't do something, I just need to be able to say I can't do it. Are you all with me? If um, I don't need to make excuses and, and say I didn't do it, have some alibi, have some lie, or I did it but I'm justified because of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Or yes, I did, but anyway. Would you stand with me tonight? If I were to ask who has made excuses, every one of us would have to raise our hands, our feet. We would all have to say, I've done that, messed up. I've uh, not been the best I should have been. But um, I'm going to ask you to just join me right now in, in prayer because I, I think the whole goal is that we do better. If I've been an excuse maker, I want to say, all right, Lord, take that away from me. I don't want to make excuses no more. I want to be, because I'm going to tell you, you're the bigger person. You're the bigger person that can say, you know what? I'm not making no excuse. I just had a bad attitude. Or I, I just messed up. And just take responsibility for it. People will accept that. God will accept that. Companies will, believe it or not, people. And hey, I've had God teach me a lesson before about some things. Huh? I'd rather just submit and say, Lord, let me come on your terms rather than you have to teach me a lesson because he can teach us one. Can we pray together? Lord, I just love you now. And I ask you, God, would you touch us tonight? Lord, if I've made excuses... Show me those excuses in prayer. Lord, if, you know, if I've excused myself, Lord, from things that I should not have, Lord, if I've put up some alibi and said, well, I couldn't have done that for whatever reason, if I've blamed other people, Lord, for stuff that I was responsible for, convict my heart, Lord. Lord, if, uh, if I've said, yes, well, I did it, but... Lord, if I'm guilty of that, convict my heart. Lord, because I know tonight that I'm free. I'm free to choose, and I can do whatever I choose to do. If I choose to come to the house of God, I'll come to the house of God. If I choose to do otherwise, I'll do otherwise. But I understand with my freedom comes another fact, and that is I'm responsible. I'm responsible for the choice that I make. I understand that. So, while I am free, I am responsible. And if I am responsible, I know that I'm going to be held accountable. That there will be an account settled one day that I'll stand before the Lord, the righteous judge of all the earth. And He'll open the books. 
You'll see if my name's there. And I will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Or, I would hear, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I know you not. Lord, I want to please you. I know it's kind of tough talk, but I want to make the right choice, and I don't want to make no excuse. I don't want to make no bones about it. I pray, God, that you'd help us to be straight talkers tonight. Lord, that we'd talk straight with you, that we'd talk straight with our brothers and our sisters, that we'd just be honest people, people of integrity, people that love you, people that love your church, people that love God's people. I ask in the name of Jesus. No more excuses. No more excuses. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me remind you of the work day. Everybody, not just leaders, everybody is encouraged to be a part of the work day starting at 9 o'clock. The leaders need to be here Saturday at 8 o'clock. Uh, leaders at 8 o'clock, everybody else at 9 o'clock, we'll be finished by 3. 